Today I'm going to talk about pediatric uroradiology. Uh, I want you to be able to recognize common pediatric GU conditions, develop a differential diagnosis for certain findings, and to hopefully stimulate you guys to want to learn and study more about pediatric GI, uh, GU conditions. When you have adrenal calcifications, neonatal adrenal hemorrhage is a common cause for it, especially in, the, in a baby that was stressed. Other causes, it could be infection, it could be TB, it could be histo, it could be fulminant meningococcemia also from uh, meningitis. Tumors can cause adrenal calcifications, neuroblastoma, up to 70% will calcify, pheochromocytomas, and dermoids that can affect the adrenal can calcify. Addison's disease can have adrenal calcifications. There's a rare thing, but they like to ask it about Wolman's disease. That's a familial xanthomatosis uh, condition. It's autosomal recessive. You get lipids and uh, that accumulate in the adrenals and you get a big liver, big spleen. You can get punctate calcifications in the adrenal and these patients will usually die in the first few months of life. But if you ever hear Wolman's disease, think adrenal calcifications, uh, big lipids, big uh, patosplenomegaly. <coughs> Here is an example. This was an IVP when we used to do IVPs. But you see these little triangular calcifications right above the superior pole of the kidneys, right where the adrenal glands live. This maintains the shape of the adrenal gland. A tumor will not, a tumor is going to be a mass that calcifies, so it's not going to keep this shape. This is classic for adrenal hemorrhage, neonatal adrenal hemorrhage. What you do is if you do an ultrasound, you will see an enlarged adrenal, and it could be echogenic because of the, of the acute blood, but as this thing, uh, the blood resolves, the, the adrenal gland will go back towards normal shape, its triangular shape, and then it can calcify. All your pheos, your, all your other tumors are going to have a mass like. It's not going to be your triangular shape. Here are subtle amorphous irregular calcifications in the right upper quadrant. Remember when you read out with me, I always go white calcifications, black portal venous gas, white calcifications. Because up to 70% of babies with patients with neuroblastoma they'll get calcifications. They, they, babies can be born with neuroblastoma, so if, that's why we always look for calcifications in the upper abdomen. Here's the CT. This looks like the kidney. There's the left kidney, but this is not the kidney. You keep going down and you can see that this is above the kidney and it's not coming from the kidney. This is an adrenal mass and this was a neuroblastoma. Uh, here is a, the, the main differential. Sometimes it's difficult to say, is this coming from the adrenal or is it coming from the kidney? And uh, MRI is probably better for that, but you can do reconstructions on CTs. But here, what we'd like to be able to see is the claw sign, which tells you that this is coming from the kidney. This is a huge mass in a little child. This is a Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor, only about 10% of Wilms tumor will calcify. So for your boards and for studying, you need to know the difference between neuroblastoma and Wilms. They love that. Neuroblastoma versus Wilms, the organ, neuroblastoma, can be anywhere in the, in the sympathetic chain, but its favorite spot is the adrenal, but it can be anywhere in the sympathetic chain. The organ of Zucca candle is another place that it likes to be, and that's uh, right below the IMA takeoff from the aorta. Wilms tumor is almost always in the kidney. Uh, the best prognosis for neuroblastoma is if the kid is less than one year of age. If the kid is less than one year of age is in the adrenal, that's the best prognosis for neuroblastoma. Wilms tumor, the classic age is two to three. It could be one to eight. Uh, it's rare in an infant. Infant is less than one year of age. Classic is a two or three year old. Mom's giving the kid a bath and feels an abdominal mass. That's the classic board question, written question that they love to ask. Ca up to 70% calcify, about 10% calcify in Wilms. The shape, these are stippled and these are curvy linear if they are. This is bilateral on 10%. This is bilateral on less than 10%. You have, this can cross the midline over 50% of the time. This may cross the midline. Another name for Wilms tumor is nephroblastoma. The renal vein, this is usually in the adrenal. So think about it, if, the, if this mass in the adrenal gets really, really big, it will encase the IVC in the renal vein as opposed to the kidney tumor, which is in the kidney. And so it's gonna grow into the renal vein and the IVC, it will grow into it. Metastasis is the favorite place for neuroblastoma to metastasize to is the bone. The bone more than lymph nodes, more than liver, more than lung. 
as opposed to Wilms where lung and liver, are, lung is the most common and liver is second. So it's the total opposite of neuroblastoma. Remember when I go black, black hole, black uh, mets, black infection, and I go black circle, black infection, black or white tumor, black or white infection, black or white tumor. If we see moth-eaten bone in a kid, we worry about metastatic neuroblastoma. We worry about Ewing sarcoma, the rare type of osteosarcoma or infection because neuroblastoma loves to go to the bone. They're associated with congenital heart defects, aganglionosis of the bowel. Wilms tumor is associated with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, sporadic aniridia, renal or genital anomalies, and hemihypertrophy. So you, we just had one the other day, they said hemihypertrophy, and they did an ultrasound on, so we have to look for Wilms and Beckwith-Wiedemann, which gives you a big liver, big spleen. Neuroblastoma. They, the, the clinician should order a urine VMA level because it will be elevated 95%. When the, when the primary adrenal neuroblastoma metastasizes to the skin, it's called blueberry muffin syndrome. Wager syndrome is a rare genetic syndrome in which the affected children are predisposed to Wilms, about 45%, aniridia, GU anomalies, male more than female, and mental retardation. And if you add obesity to it, that would be Wagero. This is Wagers from a result of a deletion on chromosome 11. These most cases are not inherited. Uh, when I, like I said, if it's associated with childhood obesity, you just put an O at the end of that. They can also get pancreatitis and renal failure. If you do an IVP or you do a, uh, a KUB after the patient had a CT or for, had a contrast for uh, uh, like a CT of the chest or CT of the extremity, and you do the KUB and you only see one kidney, you don't see the other one, you got to think about maybe it's congenitally absent. The differential, maybe it was resected, surgically removed. Maybe the kid had a uh, uh, multi-system dysplastic kidney and auto-infarcted and went all the way down to nothing. Maybe it had Wilms tumor or other tumor and they took it out. Maybe it was xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis, proteus morabilis, and it was just a pussed out kidney that doesn't work, and they, it was infection, so they surgically removed it. Maybe it was significant atrophy from chronic infections, and it's not working anymore. Maybe it is atrophic because of renal infarction. Maybe it's atrophic because, uh, I guess those are the big ones, previous infection, uh, ischemia, non-functioning kidney, maybe it just doesn't work. Maybe it's there, but it doesn't work, so it didn't take it up. Maybe there's renal artery stenosis, renal vein thrombosis. Uh, in trauma, maybe it was the renal artery was avulsed. It could be ectopic. That's what we need to look in the pelvis. We need to look in the, in the thorax. We need to see if, there's the, if we see two on the same side, cross-fuse ectopia. Here is the bladder. Here is the left ureter. Here's the right ureter, and there's the kidney, a pelvic kidney. Do you see how the ureter fits the exact length of the kidney, where the kidney is? It's not like it was way up in the abdomen at the beginning and now it fell down to the pelvis. Otherwise, you'd have a lot of ureter that's looping around. The kidneys form in the pelvis and they follow the psoas muscle up to where they should be. And so if it had gone where it should be, the ureter would be a lot longer because it went all the way up there. But this is a pelvic kidney. You have to, this is worrisome because of increased risk of trauma. You can imagine that sitting right over the, uh, the pelvic brim and in trauma, you can get an increased risk of causing a, a renal uh, contusion or renal laceration. They increase risk of infection because they're not rotated properly, <coughs> increased risk of stones. Here is a big long ureter, and this is going up into the chest, as is the bowel. So there's probably a Morgagni hernia in here, but this is an intrathoracic kidney. This was in utero because the ureter grew that long to let that kidney go way up high. Here is a, this was a, uh, a, a VCUG and there was reflux. And here you have both kidneys on the same side. It's more common when you have cross fuse ectopia for the left kidney to be on the right. That's much more common than the right kidney to be on the left. And you, they always ask this ectopic, the abnormal kidney, its ureter inserts normally. So this left kidney is over here fused to the right kidney, the lower pole of the right kidney but this right ureter goes where it should be and so does the left ureter. The left ureter will cross the midline and go back to its left UVJ. So it's not gonna both be over here. The left ureter will insert normally where it should. Here's an ultrasound showing a very long looking kidney which was actually the two kidneys. Here's the CT, you see a renal pelvis, renal pelvis. The, the kidneys are fused. Here are two ureters. 
Here's the two ureters. So this is cross fusectopia. This is the most common when the left kidney is over here, apparently on the right, uh, fusing with the right kidney. Here is a little baby that had a, this uh, KUB performed after a CT study. And you can see the axis of the kidney is abnormal. This is a horseshoe kidney. Usually they're gonna be connected at the lower pole. They can actually have the parenchyma connected or there could be just a fibrous connection. But this, like I said, increased risk of, of having a trauma, infection, stones, also increased risk of Turner syndrome and increased risk of getting Wilms tumor in horseshoe kidneys. Pelvocalyectasis. When you ask a clinician, you say there is hygienophrosis, they're gonna think obstruction. When we know that reflux can cause hygienophrosis, as can uh, uh, just being dilated on its own. So the proper term we probably should always use is pelvocalyectasis if we're not sure if it's reflux or really obstructed. Pelvocalyectasis means, means the renal pelvis is big and so are the calyces. Causes of that are, are obstruction. It could be a UPJ stenosis, a UVJ stenosis, a stone obstructing it. Any filling defect in the collecting system when we used to do IVPs, but if you do a CT or whatever, any filling defect could be stones, slough papilla, fungal balls, tumors, blood clots. So the, you have to know that filling defects in the collecting system could be a stone. It could be a blood clot. It could be a slough papilla, it could be a, a fungal ball, or a tumor, a transitional cell. Uh, other causes of pelvic haliectasis would be a ureter seal. Ureter seals, especially when you have the weigert meyer rule, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, that causes an obstruction. Uh, post urethral valve causes an obstruction because of black back flow, the back pressure. The, your, the bladder gets huge because it can't shoot through this little tiny uh, the, the post-urethral valve, and so the bladder gets real trabeculated, and then back pressure makes the, ur the urine from the kidneys will make a big uh, hydronephrosis and the hydroureter. You can have an extrinsic compression that causes obstruction, such as a retrocaval ureter, which is usually on the right, or a pelvoabdominal mass can cause it. Non-obstructive causes include reflux, a congenital primary mega ureter, prune belly syndrome, also known as Eagle Barrett syndrome. The triad is crypt orchidism, urinary tract obstruction from a functional abnormality of the emptying of the bladder versus less likely a urethral atresia and uh, absent abdominal wall musculature. So here we go. Here, this is the Foley catheter. Here is the classic cobra head of a ureter seal. Here is an inverted ureter seal. It's going into here. You're not having the cobra head, but this is a huge ureter seal. That ureter is massive. Here's a cobra head. Do you see the cobra head? The white head of the snake and that black outlining it makes it a cobra head. What's the difference between pelvocalyptosis and hydronephrosis again? When the clinicians think of hydronephrosis, it's, they think obstruction. Just like if you dictate there's an infiltrate in the right lower lobe and it's a tumor, we know it could be a tumor, it could be blood, it could be edema, it could be cells. They think infiltrate pneumonia. Okay. So that's, we have to be careful what we say. If you say hydro, they're probably gonna think it's obstructed, even though the hydronephrosis was from reflux, which is not an obstruction. Here is an IVP on a little baby. You can see it's a child. Here is the urinary bladder, and there's a huge filling defect in it. Look, we see the upper pole collecting system, we see the lower pole collecting system. Here, do you see the upper pole collecting system? No, this is called the drooping lily. What happens is when you have a duplicated collecting system, the Weigert-Meyer rule, the upper pole will obstruct, the lower pole will reflux. The upper pole ureter will insert ectopically. It will go inferior and medial to the normal location, often in the ureter seal. That ureter seal causes an obstruction. That's why we don't see the upper pole here. That upper pole is totally obstructed and it's getting big and big and it's pushing the lower pole down. And so instead of having collecting systems like this, this is obstructed. So now all we have is this one being pushed down. It's called the drooping lily sign right here. All we see is this, it's drooping down because this is obstructed. This ureter inserts to its normal location, the normal UVJ. But what happens is when this, this upper pole moiety ureter courses through the bladder wall, it goes right next to the normal UVJ and it thins the UVJ out so it allows reflux. The, so the lower pole refluxes, the upper pole obstructs. This could easily be on your ACR in-service exam or your, your boards because it's called the Weigert-Meyer rule. Very important that you know this. 
This is a huge ureteral seal from the upper pole. That's the Weigert Meyer rule with a huge ureteral seal from the upper pole moiety, which inserted inferior medial to the normal UVJ. Here's an ultrasound with the right kidney, left kidney. We see bilateral hygienophrosis or pelvic iliacusis. <coughs> Here on the transverse image of the urinary bladder, this is where you look for a big ureter. These are dilated ureters, so there's not only pelvic iliacusis, there's also hydro ureters. And here's the base of the bladder, it's sagittal. So the base of the bladder, you see the keyhole. That's, you don't normally see this, but this was the keyhole from a posterior urethral valve. So when you see this, and it's a boy, they're gonna do a VCUG. Here is a shrunken, trabeculated bladder. Look at the wall is thickened. There's a out pouching here, probably a diverticulum, big diverticulum. Here is the posterior urethra, and that is way too big compared to the rest of the urethra. And this is a posterior urethral valve. Here is another VCUG showing, this is the dilated posterior urethra. The filling defect is called the verum montanum. That's where the ejaculatory ducts insert. This is called a prostatic utricle. That's the verum montanum where the orifice of the ejaculatory duct. This is, a, this is felt to be a mullerian duct remnant, but there's some controversy lately. Is it, is it really a mullerian duct remnant? It might not be, but you'll see this. This is not a diverticulum. This is a prostatic utricle. Here is where the valve is. There's three types of posterior valves. The most common is when the valve come, is from here and it extends distal. It's from the posterior urethra, which this is the posterior urethra. It goes from there, just past the level of the vera montanum and extends distal. The rare, more rarer type is when it, ex, it comes here and it extends proximal. That's, the, uh, that's not the rarest, but that's not very common by far. The one that comes here and goes distal is by far the most common. The rarest is you have a, you have like a diaphragm with a little hole in it. So the whole urethra has this diaphragm in it and there's a little hole causing the obstruction. So that is the posterior urethral valve. This is your membranous urethra within the UG diaphragm at the external sphincter. This is important because later on I'm going to talk about wetting. Boys ectopic ureters will always insert proximal to this. So boys will not get wetting if they have an ectopic ureter. Girls can get wetting. It can go in their vagina. It can go in their fallopian tube. It can go in their uterus. So they can get wetting. Boys do not get wetting from an ectopic ureter because it will insert proximal. If it starts right here, you're not going to get wetting because that's the external sphincter. Here is your membranous urethra. Uh, your, I'm sorry, your bulbous urethra. That's the membranous. Bulbous urethra, and that's your penile urethra. Here is an ant mini. And for students that don't know what ant mini means, it's a term that we use when you look at this and there's no other differential this could be, it, you, everyone should know it, especially senior residents should know it. Uh, it's because if, if you have an ant named Minnie and she came right by you and you see her, you should know that's Aunt Minnie. You don't think, that's, is that Aunt Minnie or is that Aunt Sarah? Unless they're twins. But here, you have a, you have a very dilated renal pelvis, dilated calyces, infundibula with club calyces and the ureter courses medial to the L4 pedicle on that side. It's coursing medial. This is a retrocaval ureter. If they're both ureters are, are going medial, that would be retroperitoneal fibrosis. Uh, but this was a retrograde. The urologist put his catheter in the bladder, cannulated the UVJ and injected contrast, and it shows the retrocaval ureter, which is persistence of the right posterior cardinal vein ventral to the ureter and failure of development of the right supracardinal system. But just get this, if you see it go medial to the pedicle, the L4 pedicle, that's a retrocaval ureter. If they show you one and you see both ureters going medial, that's retroperitoneal fibrosis. Here is a VCG. We do these VCGs all the time. What we, they, usually they do it on a boy, they usually do it on a boy's first uh, bladder infection or if they do an ultrasound, uh, a lot of times they'll say fetal pyelectasis or pelvic ileectasis on a fetal ultrasound and then we do the renal ultrasound we see a dilated pelvis. If we see bilateral dilated pelvises or, or calyx seals, calyx seal systems, as a boy we need to do a VCG to look for a posterior valve and for reflux. In girls they will do they will do the renal ultrasound usually after the second UTI but it all depends. They, they, they're changing it now, they might not. But here is the bladder. What we're doing is we're using uh, catheter that the, the, the across the street the urology uh, nurses put in or the pediatric nurses put in uh, on the wards here the pedi pediatric nurses put the catheters in we use gravity we use dilute cystographin we do not hand inject this 
Uh, Amy Rowell, who is a resident here, went to a pediatric fellowship. She's at Texas Tech in Lubbock. And she was covering one day and I got a text and she said, the, the, uh, the, 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 the tech is saying that the other radiologist that does these always hand injects. And she goes, I don't think we're supposed to hand inject. And I said, do not hand inject ever on a VCG. You could rupture the bladder if I could, if you're strong enough, you could push so much force in it, you could rupture the bladder. Gravity, we put it on, we just have it hanging. When the bladder gets real full, that will stop dripping. It'll get less, first you'll see a solid stream, then it'll start dripping, then it'll get slower and slower and slower, and then it'll stop when the, when the bladder gets full. So you cannot perforate them. What we wanna look for is the contour. We wanna do one early on when the bladder's just partially filled. That's the best way to see a ureter seal because when the bladder gets real, real full, you can miss a ureter seal. We wanna oblique them so we can see behind the bladder, the contour of the bladder. We wanna always look for reflux. We wanna make sure that there's no reflux. There should be a one-way street. Urine and con uh, urine should go from your kidney into your ureter into your bladder. There's not a two-way street. Urine is not normal for urine to go back up. The problem with it when it does reflux, it's called vesicoureteral reflux. Bladder infections are you know, bad, but they're not horrible. Kidney infections, pyelonephritis is horrible. Pyelonephritis can scar your kidneys. If you scar your kidneys bad enough, you can lose renal function. We have two kidneys, so that's great that we have two kidneys, but we'd like to keep our two kidneys working. And so we don't want pyelonephritis. And so if we see reflux, the, if you see reflux, you're across the street and you see vesicle ureteral reflux, and you say to the mom, do you have an appointment with a pediatrician? She said, in a month. And you say, are you on antibiotics? Is the baby on I daily prophylactic antibiotics? And they tell you no, you call the pediatrician and you send them to them because the pediatrician needs to write an order for antibiotics because when you have reflux, the baby needs to be on prophylactic reflux every day until they outgrow it. Most of the time they'll outgrow it. The higher the grade, which I'll explain to you in a second, the more likely urology is gonna have to do surgery, reimplant the ureter or something. Grade one is when it only goes into the ureter. It could be minimal grade one. It could, might only be in the pelvic ureter. It might be all the way close to the renal pelvis and then stop, that's still grade one. Grade two is once it hits into the renal pelvis, that's grade two, but there's no dilatation. Grade three is when the renal pelvis and the calyces start getting a little bit bigger. Grade four is when the ureter is getting bigger, the renal pelvis and the calyces are getting bigger with blunting, and then grade five is significant dilatation tortuosity of the ureter, huge renal pelvis, huge blunted calyces. This is grade five. Look how tortuous this ureter got. It got so big because of this constant reflux. This is significant. The urology is definitely gonna have to do uh, something about this. But uh, you have to look for bilateral reflux. Uh, you look for unilateral reflux. Here's the calyces. Look, these calyces are blunted. This is severe. Here, if you see an abdomen like this, does this look like a normal abdomen to you guys? Does any, even when you have ascites or fat, does it look like that? Does ascites ever, a protuberant abdomen ever look like that? No, this is oblong and looks soft. Here, look, it changed. Look, it looks like it has a beer gut over on this side and just a site, you know, a distension here. You know, anyone knows what this is? This is prune belly. This is because they don't have abdominal wall musculature, so their abdomen can distort into weird things. We know this is not ascites because all the bowel is not centralized. In ascites, when you're laying down, the bowel should be in the center because the ascites will do it, and it should be protuberant symmetrically. This is so asymmetric. This is prune belly syndrome, also known as Eagle Barrett syndrome. It's congenital, it's not hereditary, it's almost exclusively of males. I told you before the triad, the triad, you need to know this, absent abdominal wall musculature, urinary tract obstruction, and crypt orchidism. What they think is the largest in the urinary bladder is possibly from a urethral obstruction or atresia, but if there's not, it's a functional abnormality in bladder emptying, and this bladder gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it blocks the, it blocks the descent of the testicles. So the testicles can't go through their inguinal canal because the bladder is so big, it's blocking it, and that's why they get the crypt organism. This is a rare case. This is one that was in the, the ACR, uh, ABR thing that says you guys all need to know. It's called megacalicosis. It's, it's, not a, it's not associated with reflux. There's just an increased number of calyces. There are a ton of calyces that are very big. Look at the renal pelvis. Is the pelvis big? No. The calyces are ginormous. When you have hydro from an obstruction, 
the renal pelvis is huge, the infundibula are huge, and the calyces are huge. Here, the ureter is not big, the renal pelvis is not big, but the calyces are huge, and there's increased number. It's called megacalicosis. It's non-obstructive dilatation of the renal calyces due to malformation of the renal papilla, called megacalicosis. Renal mass is in the newborn. Okay, I've all, I always tell you guys this. You deliver a baby, you put the, pull the head down to get that one shoulder out, pull the head up to get the other shoulder out, and you catch them, clamp the cord, cut it, put them in, under the chicken lamp, and if you feel their belly and you feel a mass, number one in your differential is hydronephrosis. Number two is multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. Number three is neuro, neuroblastoma. But that, this is not this slide. I'm just telling you about this. Some, I just was reading, some people think that uh, multi-cystic dysplastic kidney might be tied with hydronephrosis now, but I still think hydro, multi-cystic dysplastic kidney, then neuroblastoma. But if it's a, coming from the kidney, the number one uh, renal, quote, mass is hydronephrosis multi cystic kidney, the most common solid renal mass is mesoblastic nephroma in an in a infant. So this is not really a mass, it's obstruction. This is, what happened is you had an in utero obstruction, you get, a tre you get an atretic uh, ureter and an atretic renal pelvis, you get massive hydro, the calyces get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and finally they pinch off. So then you get cysts of various sizes all over that do not communicate and that's multi-cystic dysplastic kidney. So it's really not a mass, but it is, quote, a mass. But if it's solid mesoblastic nephroma, the most common solid renal mass in a newborn is mesoblastic nephroma. The most common solid abdominal mass in a newborn is neuroblastoma. Wilms tumor is rare in a newborn. Newborn is uh, 30 days and less. Infant is less than a year. Wilms tumors, I told you, one to eight. Rare doesn't mean it never happens, but it does. You can have a teratoma in the, in the uh, kidney, and like I told you, Wilms is rare. If it's bilateral, still hydronephrosis, number one, polycystic kidney disease, multicystic dysplastic kidney, and that's, that's not good. Uh, nephroblastomatosis, that's multiple solid masses in the kidney. That's a precursor to Wilms tumor. These are subcapsular solid nodules, multiple sol solid nodules. I think it can also be associated with uh, with Wiedemann, I think. Single renal masses in an older child, we're talking older now, Wilms is number one. Multilocular cystic nephroma, that's a benign tumor with malignant potential, so they'll take it out. The thing you need to know about multilocular cystic nephroma is well circumscribed with a thick capsule, it's unifocal, it doesn't communicate, they're a very sized septated cysts, and it's usually in the lower pole. This is a lower pole. You, a multi cystic dysplastic kidney, you can have partial. It can be in either the top or the bottom, uh, but usually it's the whole kidney. This uh, multi locular cystic nephroma is usually in the lower pole. Focal hydronephrosis, you can have focal calyactosis in, in just the upper pole or whatever. A post traumatic cyst or an abscess can cause a, a mass renal cell carcinoma. The older the kid gets, the more likely it's renal cell carcinoma. A teratoma, and you can have a neuroblastoma in the kidney. That's not very common. Multiple renal masses in older children, nephroblastomatosis, precursor to Wilms. Wilms tumor can be uh, can be multiple. Angiomyolipomas. You think if the classic single big angiomyolipoma is in a uh, young adult female with marked hematuria, if there are multiple angiomyolipomas, you think tuber sclerosis. You'd want to do a CT of their head. Leukemia lymphoma causes renal masses. Adult polycystic kidney disease, now called autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, causes multiple cysts in the kidneys. Abscesses. Here is a classic multicystic dysplastic kidney. You have the left kidney here. You have very thin cortex. The cortex is not normal. You have cysts of various sizes that do not communicate. They do not communicate. If they communicate, then you worry that it's, this is hydronephrosis. There are multiple non-communicating cysts of various sizes throughout the non-functioning kidney, separated by dysplastic parenchyma. It's associated with a ure ureteral or UPJ atresia and a contralateral abnormality. So when you see it on one side, you really need to look at the other side because they, they can have, the number one is a reflux, but they can also have a UPJ stenosis. So they would need a VCUG to look for reflux. They would need 
to you to look for a UPJ stenosis. Multi, about two thirds of these will just spontaneously involute and they'll shrink down to a little scarred, nothing kidney. But a third won't. These, can have, these patients may or may not have hypertension. Most don't, but they could. Even if you take the kidney out, they can still have the hypertension. Here's a case. We have this huge renal pelvis that communicates with these things, but the pelvis is bigger than the, the quote, uh, cysts. They do communicate. This was a, a called uh, multisystem spastic kidney in utero. There is, this is either due to a severe congenital hydronephrosis or a, the most rare type of multisystic dyspastic kidney, which is called the hydronephrotic obstructive type. When you have a huge renal pelvis, the, you can see they're still communicating, but this could still be the rare type called multisystic dyspastic kidney hydronephrotic obstructive type. So just realize that it's, but if this was a, there's no parenchyma, you barely see any parenchyma. They did a nuke med study in this thing, it's not functioning. So it doesn't matter if it's a hydronephrotic type or if it's multisystic dyspastic kidney, the kidney is not functioning. But if it was a brand new baby, you'd want to worry. There are communications. Is that hydro? Do a nuke med study. If there's any renal function, we know it's not multisystem spastic kidney, and maybe the urologist can go and put a stent in there or a nephrostomy tube to try to save whatever function there is in that kidney. Here's a KUB that you might have done for an IV. This was done for an IVP, but maybe you just did it after a CT or any IV contrast. We have huge kidneys bilaterally huge kidneys and there's the contrast in the bladder and if you did an ultrasound on this baby you would see huge echogenic kidneys this is infantile polycystic kidney disease or autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease polycystic they have one two millimeter cysts so you cannot see that on any imaging modality and what happens is there's so many of them all those little interfaces make it echogenic so on an ob ultrasound if they see a enlarged kidneys that are echogenic infantile polycystic kidney disease or autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. You need to know this. This is very important. Uh, adult polycystic kidney disease is big cysts. These are little tiny one to two millimeters cysts. These will either have real bad kidney problems and mild liver problems or equal moderate both or severe liver problems, periportal fibrosis and minimal renal tubular ectasian problems. So four types, antenatal, which is the most common, 90% with cystic changes of the renal tubules, patient dies from renal failure and pulmonary hypoplasia. If your kidneys don't work in utero, you don't make urine, which is what the amniotic fluid is, their lungs won't form, They'll, they, they will, if you see a baby and they're born with bilateral pneumothoraces, you have to really worry about, that's pulmonary hypoplasia and there's some renal anomaly or obstruction of the urethra because they didn't make urine. So they, they usually die within 24 hours, and uh, they, almost all of them are gonna be dead by one year, and it's uniformly fatal. Type two is the neonatal type. When renal tubulitation is 60%, now you're starting to get the hepatic fibrosis. Patient's gonna die from renal failure and hypertension within the first year of life, usually. The infantile type, the renal tubulitation is only 20%, so there's not bad kidney disease, but now we're getting moderate periportal fibrosis of the liver. And these patients d will develop this usually within three to six months of life. That's why it's called infantile. They're gonna die from chronic renal failure and hypertension and portal hypertension. And the juvenile type, the renal tubulitation is only 10%, but the severe hepatic fibrosis and proliferation of bile ducts, and they're gonna die from portal hypertension. And they're gonna develop this between the ages of one and five years of age. So there's four types, just from know that if the kidney disease is bad, the liver disease is not bad. If the liver disease is bad, the kidney disease is not that bad. Here is an angiomyelopoma kidney. You do Hounsfeld units on it, it's negative 50, negative 100, it's, it's fat. And you do the CT, you see these subependymal calcified tubers. This is classic tuber sclerosis. Uh, the triad, it just it's not mean to be rude, is zits, fits, nitwits. Zits are adenosebaceum, shagreen patches, adenosebaceum. Fits are seizures, nitwits. A lot of these are mentally retarded. So zits, fits, and nitwits. You have to know that you can get a, a tuber in a tuber sclerosis in the anterior portion of the third ventricle, right near the frame of the Monroe. This is the frame of the Monroe. This is the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. This is the third ventricle. If you have a, a tuber right here, it can degenerate into a malignancy and that's called a giant cell astrocytoma. So giant cell astrocytomas are in patients with tuberous sclerosis that that 
uh, that uh, tuber degenerated into a malignancy. Here is adult polycystic kidney disease, autosomal dominant. You have multiple cysts in the liver, multiple cysts in the kidneys, multiple cysts in the pancreas. You get cysts everywhere. You get them in the, in the you can get them in the epididymis, you can get them in the testicles, you can get them in the ovaries. You can get them everywhere. This, when you see this and you say, could the patient have autosomal polycystic kidney disease? You have to tell them in that report and tell the clinician, up to 30% of these patients get aneurysms. That can kill the patient. Po adult polycystic kidney disease, these kidneys are going to fail at some point in their life if they live long enough. So they will get renal failure, okay? But that could be later on as a thing. They could die from a ruptured aneurysm. So they're gonna need to do a CTA or MRI of the circle of Willis to look for that aneurysm. You need to let them know that. Cysts everywhere. I told you, berry aneurysm, that's the key, and they guarantee you that could be on your boards and your in-service. Berry aneurysms with this. They'll have, a lot of these will have hypertension. And it's gonna, renal, they will get renal failure. They will get renal failure. Here is another uh, uh, IVP, excretory urogram, which we used to do a lot of. But you can still see this on, because uh, they still, they'll do, trauma patients, they'll do the CT and then they'll do an abdomen or they'll get a chest x-ray and you'll still see the collecting systems or they'll do a pelvis and they might go up high and you'll see the collecting systems. You see this little calyce right here? It's a cup and there's a little round circle in the middle of it. This is papillary necrosis. This is the papilla that lives in the calyces. They, the papilla have those little collecting tubules that the urine drips down and goes into the calyces, then goes into the infundibulum, then goes into the renal pelvis and the ureter and the bladder. You can get different types of papillary necrosis. It could be around the edges. There might be straight lines around the calyces. This is the calyx. This is called the fornix. These tips are called the fornix, the fornices. Uh, that's why in bad hydro, if you have an acute obstructing stone, we do an IVP or you do a CT, you, and you see some extravasation of contrast, they probably had a fornicil rupture. There was so much pressure that stone was blocking it and you're giving contrast, which is a diuretic. It's making, it's putting a lot of fluid in that kidney as is the contrast going in there. And they, early on, early, early, early obstruction is not gonna have hydro. It's not gonna be, a, it's not gonna be dilated because it hasn't had time to dilate. So it will, the weakest point is this fornix and it can rupture. And so you can get, you can also get papillary necrosis. So if you see lines out here around the periphery where the fornices are, that's papillary necrosis. If you see this ball, that's papillary, that's central papillary necrosis. If you see a deformed calyx, that's from previous papillary necrosis. This papilla can slough off and then become a loose body, a, a filling defect, not a loose body, but a filling defect in the collecting systems. They love to ask, what are the differentials? of papillary necrosis, you have to know the differential. Mnemonics are great, it's postcard. Postcard is pyelonephritis, very common, that's a, that's a cause. O is obstruction, we have a lot of obstruction, so that's a common cause of papillary necrosis. S is sickle cell disease, we are loaded with sickle cell disease patients. T is TB, we don't have a lot of TB, but everyone says it's on the rise and it is, but we don't have a lot of it. C is cirrhosis and Christmas disease, that's uh, not very common. This is a big one, analgesic abuse. Analgesic can cause papillary necrosis. That's a huge one. R is renal vein thrombosis. It happened. <coughs> renal vein thrombosis is possible. D is diabetes and dehydration. We have that, yes we do. So the big ones, if you were like gonna be taking the boards, but the oral boards, which we don't have anymore, but you would mention pilo, obstruction, analgesic, diabetes, dehydration, sickle cell, I'd probably leave the cirrhosis out if they said any more, then you could say TB, cirrhosis, Christmas disease in there too. But the, you're more likely now to say, have the written type of question, uh, what could these possibly, be, what could this be from? And they'll have some other thing in here that's not. They might have like renal, renal tubular acidosis. That causes medullary nephrocosinosis, not papillary necrosis. I think that analgesics is the most common. That's adults. very common. And sickle cell is the most common. So, and dehydration too, but the diabetes, but the analgesic is a huge one, huge one, don't forget it. Here is a, one we had, this is the left kidney. Here's a dilated, it was, it was obstructed, it had a big uh, uh, renal pelvis. What does this look like? Gas. gas, this is gas, either in the renal pelvis, which would be called pelv, it, here we go, pyelitis, or it could be emphysematous pyelonephritis. 
So they did. They this was air in the and then pa this patient had not been instrumented. Urology didn't do a retrograde. They didn't do a, a double J. They didn't try nephrostomy. He's never had a biopsy. But this, uh, I think a week later, they did another one and it went away. This is clearly air in the kidney. Bladder wall masses. Let me go real quick. Congenital, it could be a ureter seal, a uracal cyst, you need, or a uracal remnant. Tumors in a child, rhabdomyosarcomas. In an older teenager, transitional cell. Inflammation, cystitis, schistosomiasis. This is the number one cause in all of the world for bladder wall calcifications and probably for bladder cancers because anytime you have an inflammation, you can get cancer. Schistosomiasis is endemic in Egypt, my friend. Oh, I was just waving to you. He's an Egyptian. He's an Egyptian. Just like the, bang the Bengals sing that song. Uh, if you have this and you live in Egypt and you say you don't, you're in denial. You get it? Denial. Denial. I love that one. Uh, TB can cause bladder wall calcifications and it will be a very scarred, shrunken bladder. Trauma from a hematoma. Here, I've already showed you the ureter seals. Here, look, the, this is the umbilicus, and you come down, and there's this cyst. This is a uracal cyst. Here is a, one that we had. Here's the umbilicus. Here's the dome of the bladder. There was fluid going all the way up in here. This was a patent uracus. This is urine coming out of it. You, know, you need to know the, the different things. There is a patent uracus when it's open on both ends. In utero, this is open. This connects the dome of the bladder to the belly button in utero, and then it's supposed to scar down and be nothing. If it's open at both ends, it's a patent uracus. If it closes the umbilicus but is open at the bladder, that's a uracal, uh, uh, uracal diverticulum. If it's open at the umbilicus and closed at the bladder dome, that's a uracal sinus. If it's closed at both, that's a uracal cyst. So uracal cyst closed at both ends, uracal sinus open at the belly button, uracal diverticulum open at the bladder dome, patent uracus open at both, and urine will be coming from the umbilicus. Here is an outpouching at the dome of the bladder. This was a, an example of a uracal diverticulum. It closed here, but it was open here. For adults, if you, if they do, if there's a mass at the dome of the bladder, you need to say this could be a transitional cell carcinoma, but it could be a uracal carcinoma. Uracal carcinomas are adenocarcinomas. So if they do a biopsy on a bladder mass and it came back adenocarcinoma, you know it was in a uracal carcinoma because the rest of the bladder masses are gonna be transitional cell. Dr. Hellman had a horrible, not she didn't have one, she had a patient that grew out above the pubic symphysis, grew out through the skin, and it was, a, it was an adenocarcinoma, uracal carcinoma. Here in the bladder, we have this fungating. This was from an old ACR in-service exam. This fungating, polypoid-like mass, much enhancement. Maybe if you did an ultrasound, it could look like grapes, uh, sar uh, sarcoma botrytis, or rhabdomyosarcoma. <coughs> That's the most common cause in a child for a bladder mass. An older person is gonna get a uh, uh, transitional cell. Here are numerous bladder diverticula, and in this one there's a filling defect, that's a big stone. Anytime you have diverticula, that's bad because you have stasis of urine. When you have just stasis of urine, just like any stasis of anything, bad things happen. Here in, Ameri here in the world, when you have stasis of water, you get mosquitoes. That's why they spray. And here, you get infection stones and anytime you have chronic infections if you have a squamous cell of the bladder it's probably from chronic infections here is uh, the uh, transabdominal ultrasound on a girl who had not had a period she was a teenager no menstrual cycle it's me hirsutism obese when your kid acne that's polycystic ovarian syndrome it's very important for the pediatricians and the clinicians, you need to tell these patients, please let the, the technologists do an endovaginal. Because here, you cut, this is essentially normal, but when you do endovaginal, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing multiple follicles around the periphery, numbering more than 10, 11, or 12, or 13. It used to be more than five, but now I think it's more than like 11, or 12, or 13. But they're bilateral. It's like the old rotary dial phone. They don't get big cysts. They get these little follicles all around the periphery. That's polycystic ovarian syndrome. And in a teenager, they're not gonna be big ovaries. In a 20 or 30 year old, the ovaries would be big. This kids are gonna have normal sized ovaries, but follicles all around the periphery. They're, they're heavy. They're heavy, not all of them, 
not all of them. There's there's many medical students that I have it. They don't have hirsutism. They they just they don't have periods. They're not fat. They didn't have acne. They don't meet the criteria of the, the they didn't read the book. They're thin. They're not obese. Most of these are obese and transabdominal. Does transabdominal ultrasound like obese people? No. Ultrasound hates fat people. So that's why we need to do endovaginal to get it right next to those ovaries to see this. Polycystic ovarian disease is also called Stein Leventhal syndrome. 2.5% of women have it. Androgen excess from deficient aromatase activity. These women can get pregnant. They put them on metformin and other stuff to, to prime, help prime them. They can get pregnant. It's usually in the late second decade because, well, that just, they, you know, if a 15 year old hasn't had a period yet, they start thinking, why has she had a period? Like I said, this is the classic, but not always. Enlarged ovaries, 30% have normal size ovaries. I'm telling you, a 13 or 14 year old is going to have a normal ovary. They're going to have more than 11, 12, 13 follicles around the subcapsular location. Here is an ectopic ureter inserting into the urethra. Ectopic insertion, I told you uh, the Weigert Meyer rule already. I told you that males will always insert proximal external sphincter so they won't get wetting. They can get it in the epididymis and they can get epididymitis. So if you have a pre adolescent boy with epididymitis, you worry. Could there be an ectopic ureter inserting into the epididymis? Females, I told you they can because it can insert anywhere the floating tube, the vagina, the uterus, or even the rectum. Here is another in service. I'm almost done, guys. Here's another in service test. Here's the bladder. This is so behind the bladder, in front of the rectum, is where the vagina lives. So this is the vagina and the uterus. This is hematometrocolpos. This is due to uh, an imperfect hymen, uh, vaginal, uh, 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 that opening uh, stenosis. Any kind of obstruction down there can cause all these secretions just to accumulate. We had this last week or two weeks ago. Here, this is the left testicle. The history was left scrotal fullness. Look, what does this look like? Huge tortuous vessels, bag of worms, this is a classic varicocele. You want your varicocele to be on your left because of the drainage. The, uh, the left gonadal vein goes up into the renal vein at a right angle. The right gonadal vein goes in the IVC at a, a, not a big angle at all. If you have a right-sided varicocele only, bad news. They need a CT of their abdomen and pelvis to look for a mass or something obstructing that IVC or the actual uh, right gonadal vein. Here, this is classic. This needs to be operated on. This causes a lot of blood down in the scrotum, which blood brings heat. Heat causes sterility. So this needs to be fixed. Here's what a torsion looks like. Here's the normal testicle. We always, we always image the normal testicle first. We want to see what the normal looks like. Then we go to the abnormal one. There's no color in here at all. This is acute torsion. The torsion, the first part that will be affected will be the veins. You'll lose the venous flow before the arterial flow. You know they can torse and detorse, torse and detorse. Here is a ball of fire. The epididymis is too hot. The testicles, too much flow. This is epididymorchitis. Questions. What is the most common palpable abdominal mass in the newborn? Hydronephrosis. What is the most common solid abdominal mass in the newborn? Neuroblastoma. What is the most common solid renal mass in a newborn? Mesoblastic nephroma. What is the most common palpable solid abdominal mass in a two year old? Neuroblastoma. Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor. What is the most common malignant bladder tumor in a child? Rhabdomyosarcoma. What are causes for bladder wall calcifications? Radiation. Cytoxin, cystitis, schistosomiasis, TB, transitional cell, squamous cell, limo sarcoma, urethral carcinoma. You can even get a rare osteosarcoma in the bladder wall. Do both boys and girls get wetting from an ectopic ureter? No, only girls. Do we need to locate an undecidal testicle and why? The risk of, of cancer. Which cancer? Uh, seminoma. More likely to be seminoma and sterility. Who, which has a better prognosis, epispadia or hypospadia? That's where the urethra, the opening of the urethra, it points down on hypo and up on epi. You would rather pee on your shoes than pee on your face. That's how you can remember it. 
I'm not trying to be rude. I'm trying to so you remember it. If you have ep if you pee on your face, you have epispadia. You probably have extrophy of the bladder and other anomalies. Hypospadia is usually just hypospadia. You pee on your shoes. It's down below. Here's the last question. Regarding neonatal renal vein thrombosis, which of the following is true? It is more common bilaterally. It is associated with maternal sarcoid. It extends centrifugally from the hilum. It may result in renal atrophy. Just guess. D, it's typically unilateral, more common on the left. It's associated with maternal diabetes. It usually begins in the distal vessels in the kidney and then it works its way towards the hilum, not from the hilum out. And after resolution of it, there is a variable renal atrophy and involution with variable and reciprocal return of renal function. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. I hope this stimulated you to want to learn more and read more. That, that's, what, that's what we all strive for. We all want you to want to learn more.